And a very good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to all of you. I'm your virtual host, Diksha Rena, and it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you to this eventful morning at 79th All India Ophthalmological Conference 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, to begin with the first session of the day, I would like to invite Dr. Elber Thu. Dr. Elber Thu is Professor of Clinical Ophthalmology at Joel Sugar, and he is Chief Cornea and External Disease Section and Director at Cornea and Refractive Surgery. Over to you, sir. Oh, thank you. Um... Let's see here. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Very good. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Well, thank you very much to the organizers for um, uh, inviting me to speak as part of the Cornea Society Symposium. And I thank the organizers from the Cornea Society for including me this morning. Um, my charge this morning is to talk about uh, systemic anti acanthamoebal drugs with a special focus on miltefacin, uh, probably the most recent addition to our armamentarium. Just in general, uh, if you think about anti acanthamoebal drugs, they act uh, on acanthamoebal, which is a eukaryote. It has a very negatively charged surface, which is important in the choosing medications for it. Uh, it has some similar components to human cells, fortunately and unfortunately, in the form of ergosterol, which is also found in fungal. Um, uh, species, uh, but is a relative of cholesterol, which is a component of human cells. They also have a unique um, component of beta-glucan, which is also uniquely found in fungal cells, but also in the inner cell wall membrane of acanthamoeba. So this is a chart of different antifungal areas of activity, and most of them do concentrate on either the cell wall or the cell membrane, and we'll go through why this is important as we go forward. In terms of drug targets and inhibitors in acanthamoeba, you can see that the vast majority of these are really grouped uh, in a form that affect the cell membrane of acanthamoeba. And these include things like chlorhexidine, PHMB, uh, amphotericin B, uh, and some of the azoles, which target sterols. Uh, the phospholipid analogs, which I'll talk about, which is miltefacin is one of those, uh, also acts in this area, but also in other areas around the acanthamoeba. And that's uh, probably, some explanation of its effectiveness. So starting with direct membrane acting agents, there are polyenes like amphotericin, natamycin, uh, biguanides, which we'll talk about. Um, one thing to understand uh, is that the components of a drop that you use actually do impact if, if based on the preservatives. And we showed in 2013 the benzoconium chloride that's found in normal concentrations of uh, antibiotics other than moxifloxacin are actually fairly effective against trophozoites. This was confirmed uh, two years ago in a study out of Moorfields, which actually showed the benzoconium chloride could be both trophicidal and cysticidal. In fact, they attributed the large portion of propamidine efficacy or broline to the BAK and not the actual base drug. Speaking of the cationic uh, biguanides, the ones that we think of are PHMB and chlorhexidine, but interesting, interestingly, alexidine, which was the component of uh, contact lens solution that was implicated in the fusarium outbreak in early 2004, is actually a fairly effective anti-acanthamoebal drug. We don't know what the uh, exact mechanism is, but it is a very small molecule and can penetrate and diffuse across the acanthamoeba cyst wall, which is of some benefit in killing more chronic infections. Interestingly, aminoglycosides probably also have some activity. It's fairly weak, mainly against trophozoites, and the one that's most commonly used is neomycin. If you look at some of the cell wall active antifungals, it's primarily uh, polyene antibiotics and azole antifungals. And these are inhibitors of cell wall synthesis. Uh, they inhibit either ergosterol in the case of azoles, the kind of candens work on the beta-glucan portion, uh, and there's some other miscellaneous agents. Uh, we did have one patient that was treated with caspafungin systemically, which seemed to have some effect from it. But one of the things you can tell from the chemical structure is that it's quite large and may have some difficulty getting through the cyst wall. So this may be primarily active against trophozoites. 
The azoles are a group that have been tried in the past. Um, based on a paper uh, by Schuster and Kornbinda Viswazara or Vish, um, back in 2006, uh, we were looking for uh, additional options for acanthamoeba, and we found that voriconazole was probably the most promising agent. Uh, as you know, this is highly bioavailable. It does have some clinical activity against acanthamoeba, uh, but the mix, there are mixed results in in vitro testing. Uh, the first description of its topical adjunctive use was from Wilmer, uh, where they felt that it did help with therapy. Uh, we published a case series of three patients, or three eyes of two patients who had chronic culture-proven stromal keratitis were in a challenge, re-challenge model. Uh, these patients were able to resolve their acanthamoeba keratitis with Boriconazole alone and not as adjunctive therapy. So there is some efficacy uh, against acanthamoeba. Other drugs include diamidines, the alkylophosphocholines, which I'll focus on later in 5 flu cytosine. The diamidines are probably the oldest drug that have been described for acanthamoeba. Uh, interferes with DNA synthesis and cell growth. It may also retard encystment. Really, it's primarily uh, effective against trophozoites. It's really, and also minimally cystocytal. So we use this early on in the process, usually for the first month, but don't normally continue it because of its toxicity. And the components here are propamidine and hexamidine topically, uh, but the only drug that's been used systemically has been pentamidine. This was described out of Iowa where they used this as an adjunctive therapy prior to penetrating keratoplasty and felt that it was beneficial in reducing the number of occurrences although there still were after their therapeutic keratoplasties. So concentrating on miltefacin, uh, this is an anti-leishmaniasis drug um, with anti-acanthamoebal activity. Uh, it has fairly low toxicity um, and it's been used widely in developing countries. It has a significant inhibitory effect on acanthamoeba with a cytal activity above 40 micrograms uh, per ml. Interestingly, this was first uh, developed both in Germany and in England simultaneously in England as an anti-neoplastic agent, uh, and it was uh, in Germany as an immunomodulatory um, agent. So this actually is a very interesting drug, and it's an anti-neoplastic. It also has wide-ranging antibacterial, antifungal, antiprotozoal, and antiviral activity, and is also a suppressor of the immune system. So this is a, it's a very complex drug. You would expect to have a lot of side effects, but in practice, it's actually very, very well tolerated. This was part of the original paper where I found voriconazole. Miltefacin was always the more interesting of the two, but was not available here in the US. Uh, and it was really shown to be cysticidal in a more rapid fashion than voriconazole. And we found that with voriconazole, we needed to treat patients anywhere between three to seven months really for uh, the drug to have full effect. So this is uh, an alkylphosphocholine. Um, it has an orphan designation in Europe, but it is now approved here in the US since December, I think, of 2015 for acanthamoeba keratitis and the year prior for leishmaniasis. It's still fairly expensive. It's dosed 50 milligrams DID or TID, depending on weight. And there's a WHO recommendation uh, and cutoff for weight where you would use one or the other. The big concern that most people have with this that is in animal studies, it may cause fetal harm. So it's advised not to use during pregnancy or within five months following therapy, and I'll explain why in just a moment. It causes impaired fertility uh, uh, and is a teratogen. Really for humans, the main uh, side effects are vomiting or diarrhea. Uh, it may increase serum keratinine uh, and also liver enzymes, but these are usually within the first week and it's rare that it would ever actually cause any permanent damage either from nephrotoxicity or hepatotoxicity. There have also been some reports of Stevens-Johnson as there were with uh, basically any drug and some th thrombocytopenia, but generally in widespread use around the world, even in areas with poor nutrition and poor follow-up, uh, the number of uh, descriptions of um, side effects are fairly far and few between. As far as the mechanism of action is concerned, we're not really sure what it is, but it appears to be an inhibitor of protein kinase B, which is an essential process in the intracellular signaling pathway. In leishmaniasis and in humor tu human tumor cells, it triggers ap apoptosis, and it's thought to interfere with the synthesis and integrity of cell membranes and intracellular signaling molecules. And this is a schematic on the right showing that it has, probably has a multifactorial uh, effect on the cell, including uh, destabilizing the membranes of mitochondria, the cell wall, and also causing apoptosis, as I mentioned. Another advantage of the drug is that it's highly bioavailable, and the absorption is greater than 80%, and 
and it's a very long half-life, around 31 days. And the reason why the recommendation against um, having uh, uh, or attempting fertility is that uh, the levels are detectable up to five months after therapy. So these are the early studies in the laboratory. On the left, you'll see these, these are several different alkyl phosphocholines. And the one, that, the one that was most effective was APC1, which is miltefacin, that you see in all of these curves is the lower curve, uh, indicating the greatest kill rate. And in the right is a uh, graph with different acanth amoeba strains, basically showing that it is concentration dependent and not so much dose dependent. And they were, and the bottom line there is really the 160 micrograms per milliliter uh, concentration. This is a graph showing that miltefacin does have an extremely long half-life. And after a month of treatment, you can still find levels uh, five months later. And this gives you an idea of the decay rate over time. They moved on to animal studies. These were well after the original description in 2006. They published in 2014 and 2012. In a Syrian hamster model, they were able to show the 160 micromolar concentration that was described earlier resulted in 85% cure. And that if you combine this with THMB, it actually heightened uh, the level of clearance of acanth amoeba. Uh, Bupesh Bhaga at uh, LV Prasad uh, took that uh, concentration and, and treated five patients. Um, he felt that all of the patients failed uh, primarily because they had an increase in the amount of inflammation. One patient ended up with an evisceration, three with therapeutic keratoplasty, and one was eventually lost to follow-up. Uh, you can describe that as a cure if you want. Uh, our personal experience started in 2011, and that was an index case that you see at the top. This patient uh, I'll describe later, but generally our results have been pretty good. Uh, we did have one patient who had a nucleation, and that was because of epithelial downgrowth, uh, not from persistence of the organism. We published earlier this year the multi-center experience with miltefacin uh, garnered from eight different centers around the U.S. Uh, patients were diagnosed microbiologically in 12 and or confocal microscopy. There was some crossover. Uh, prior therapy, there were 14 of 15 uh, that um, had had biguanides prior, nine had had an azole of some kind, and five of them had had recurrences after penetrating or therapeutic keratoplasty. And you can see the average time from the time of diagnosis to treatment was 216 days. So these patients were all patients who were felt to be recalcitrant with some on a shorter timeline. The results were that all patients at the end of the study were free of acanth amoeba. Three were considered failures, one because they had epithelial downgrowth. Another one had recurrence after miltefacin, which resolved with topical medications, although miltefacin was probably still on board at the time they were using the topical medications. And then one patient had discontinued their second course after uh, improving after their first course, having a recurrence several months later, um, but they discontinued because of elevated LFTs eventually underwent a PKP and uh, additional topical therapy and was also disease free. Importantly, all of these patients, about three quarters of them uh, experienced a large spike in inflammation around week three of treatment. Uh, and this took the form of either increased corneal infiltrate or increased anterior chamber coagulum. Uh, and, but these were modifiable with topical steroids in the vast majority of cases and most patients continue therapy through that. Uh, 10 of the 15 interestingly described a significant improvement in pain within a week or so of a starting therapy, uh, which was interesting, but we don't know what the mechanism is. There have been a number of other studies um, from the UK and from the US, uh, which have described similar experiences. Uh, Dr. Amescu is going to be talking later, who authored the largest paper uh, of, these, of this group. Uh, they had six patients, and they all had the symptom of inflammation with perforation. Uh, we were able to avoid that in all of our patients just by adding an immunomodulatory agent like topical corticosteroids to try to obviate that. And it seemed to be successful in allowing them to continue therapy. So in conclusion, miltefacin is a wide-ranging, anti-infective, anti-neoplastic, immunomodulatory uh, drug. The pharmacokinetics show a very high oral bioavailability with excellent tissue levels widely distributed throughout the body and a long half-life, which makes an ideal systemic medication for tissue penetrating um, uh, infections. Uh, the, the metabolism of this, uh, basically it's broken down in individual cells into uh, physiologic components. So there is no excretion from the liver or kidneys, uh, and that's why the toxicity is relatively low. 
Main side effects are GI tolerability. Uh, there may be reproductive or teratogenic effects in animals, but it hasn't been proven in humans. Uh, there's, I think there's ample evidence now that in vitro and in vivo evidence that it has good anti acanthin mule activity when used systemically. And it's probably, in my opinion, the most effective of all the systemic medications that are currently described for acanthamoeba. The severe ocular inflammation can be modulated with adjunctive corticosteroid use at the time. Unchecked, it may lead to ker ker keratolysis and perforation. Interestingly, patients who are treated with this for leishmaniasis can also get an idiopathic inflammation of their eye, uh, which may also cause some significant uh, uh, pain and morbidity. Uh, and this may be an idiosyncratic response of the body, uh, Tilmel Telfetson. And then finally, I, want you to invite, I wanted to invite you to my hometown and where I live currently in Chicago for the World Cornea Congress uh, in 2022, immediately preceding the American Academy of Ophthalmology. And thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Tu, for an excellent presentation. It's a great way to uh, kick off uh, this symposium, which is performed in conjunction with the Cornea Society my name is Anthony Aldave. I'm the Vice President for National Relations uh, for the Cornea Society. Dr. Tu, as you may know, is the immediate past president of the Cornea Society. And the topic of this symposium is strategies for prevention and management of infectious keratitis in challenging situations. Obviously, acanthamoeba keratitis certainly qualifies for a challenging uh, situation. We have three minutes uh, for Q&A for uh, Dr. Tu. I don't see if we have any questions from uh, the audience, but I would invite any other panelists uh, to ask Dr. Tu questions if you have any. Uh, one question I have is uh, maybe for Dr. Reyna. Is miltefacine available in India? Uh, and if so, is the cost an issue as far as availability? This is a question also from Namrata. Is Let's cost see. an issue as far as being able to obtain it for your patients? Actually, it's been approved in India for quite a number of decades. It's the first country that approved miltefacin for leishmaniasis, and all of the initial studies in leishmaniasis were actually conducted in India, so it should be widely available there. So it is available, and but it is costly. That is definitely there, but it is very much available in India. And Dr. Tu is right. It has been available for many years. Costly, I, I think... I think Elmer had showed us it was $50,000 for one month treatment in the United States. Is it that costly in India no, 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 or no, a little no, bit more reasonable? No, 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 no. no. It is much more uh, reasonable here. It doesn't cost uh, more than uh, 15,000 rupees. So 15,000 would be all of you have been in India divided by $70. <laughs> so much, much more reasonable. $150 or $120. So that's really not too much. Oh, that's good. Well, I appreciate, uh, Elmer, your insights. And I know personally, I've actually consulted Dr. Tu on several of my acanthamoeba cases and his, his experience is invaluable to helping me uh, in management of my patients. Also, Dr. Mesqua, who we're gonna hear from later, has also been a great resource to me for managing my patients with acanthamoeba. If I, I might, we'll move... might make one comment, Tony. Please. Yeah, so one thing I would recommend is that with, uh, I know that there's a propensity to use the miltefacin in multiple courses. I think it's probably a good idea to just use one month uh, because of its long half-life. I think it does build up over time. So I think it's worthwhile just to use one month first and take a pause and see how they respond before adding uh, additional medication, just as a, uh, as a side hint. Thank you, sage advice. We'll now go to the next speaker, who is a current president of the Cornea Society, Dr. Catherine Colby. Uh, her topic that she'll be speaking on uh, is pediatric herpetic keratitis. You see on the slide uh, on the screen that Dr. Colby is the Elizabeth J. Cohen Professor and Chair of Ophthalmology at New York University. Um, she previously was in Chicago, uh, close to Dr. Tu. She's known to all of us for her uh, expertise in a wide range of topics in our field, and often at the podium in the last year or two talking about decimate stripping only. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, she also has a long-standing interest in pediatric um, herpetic keratitis, and she'll be talking to us on that subject now. Uh, great, um, thank you, Tony.
Can you see my screen? Perfect, perfect. Yes, we okay. can. Uh, thank you. It, it's really a pleasure to uh, be doing a collaborative symposium with the All India Ophthalmologic Society. Um, I'm going to be speaking today on pediatric herpes, a topic that is certainly challenging. I don't have any financial interest. The use of systemic acyclovir is not approved by the FDA in the US for children. And I do receive some royalties for my, uh, corneal, my book on corneal disease for children. I'd like to be in with a case. Uh, this is a healthy 10 year old girl who was sent to me urgently for unilateral viral conjunctivitis with the recent onset of corneal edema. The referring ophthalmologist thought that she had adenoviral conjunctivitis. She had had a similar episode one month prior and her vision was reduced to 2080. She also demonstrated reduced corneal sensation. On exam, you can see here a classic picture of a Wesley ring. And so my diagnosis in this setting was herpetic keratitis. Um, I started her on oral acyclovir and topical load of prednol uh, three times a day. Four days later, you can see that the ring uh, is beginning to resolve and that there is some stromal edema uh, consistent with um, disc form edema. She did well and in one week, the steroid was reduced to twice daily. Two weeks later, her vision had improved to 2050. She had resolving edema, and I reduced her to lodopredinol Q day and a prophylactic dose of oral acyclovir, which is 400 milligrams twice daily. She had a minor flare a year later, which responded to increased steroids, and she was stable for at least five years out on a very low dose of steroid and oral acyclovir with excellent vision. So we know that herpes can be a very complicated disease in the anterior segment. And you can describe it many different ways by the onset of its um, action, either primary, latent, or recurrent, by the location within the cornea, epithelial, stromal, or endothelial, or by its mechanism, infectious or inflammatory. Recurrent herpes simplex is quite common in children and manifests in multiple different ways, including blepharoconjunctivitis, various types of epithelial infection, stromal disease, and even uveitis. This is a montage of various forms of herpetic uh, disease of the anterior segment. And so you can see here a primary rash, a beautiful dendrite, a geographic ulcer, interstitial keratitis with lumbitis, discoform edema, a neurotrophic defect, and then focal lumbitis. And we all know the end result of stromal HSV is a scarred vascularized cornea for which there really is no effective treatment. Uh, and we do try to avoid this. So a number of years ago, we uh, did a large series of pediatric uh, herpetic um, patients in Boston over a 10 year period. We had 53 patients, four of them had bilateral disease, so it was 57 eyes. The mean age was five, but they ranged from uh, young um, babies to um, teenagers. We had a long duration of follow-up of over three years, and most children had symptoms for about two weeks prior to presentation. Three quarters of them had a single manifestation, and one quarter had multiple manifestations during their uh, time of follow-up. The blepharoconjunctivitis was common in our series, and keratitis was really the most, most um, dominant form of infection. And most of that three quarters was stromal uh, disease, including um, 20 of 29 IK and nine of 29 other forms of stromal disease. More importantly, however, about a third were misdiagnosed prior to uh, presentation. About 80% had residual scarring with a half having a central scar. And because of the scarring and um, melting of the cornea, uh, about a quarter had uh, induced irregular astigmatism, also associated with the reduction in vision to less than 2040. Of those who could be tested, remember these are children we're talking about, so it's kind of hard to test a two-year-old, uh, about two-thirds of them had reduced corneal sensation. 
Recurrence was high in this population over 80% over the course of the study, which occurred at approximately 13 months. Treatment was with oral acyclovir suspension for young children and pills as children were old enough to take pills. Stromal disease and iritis were treated with steroids according to the clinical course. In general, acyclovir was well tolerated. The majority of, of children in our study received it and only one had some GI upset in the setting of a pre-existing lactose intolerance. Uh, 16 children used it for one year or longer and had no side effects. This is from our paper, it's the treatment guidelines. And basically I like to make things simple for parents. Uh, and we do this basically um, by half uh, teaspoons or 2.5 milliliters and adjust the dose uh, according to the weight of the child. There is a wide um, safety margin uh, for acyclovir. Since we published our study, a group in Mexico has also presented similar results of about 100 patients, slightly older patients of nine years for, with a shorter duration of follow-up. And they too found uh, interstitial keratitis in quite a few patients and a high recurrence rate. Also, they showed reduced vision. So I'd like to uh, continue with a few uh, case reports that illustrate some important points. Uh, this is a photograph from an eight-year-old girl with a four-year history of steroid-dependent keratitis. When I saw her, she had the neovascularization, decreased corneal sensation, and anterior stromal footprints that were very suspicious for her herpetic keratitis. I started her on oral acyclovir, and for the first time in four years, her topical steroid was able to be reduced and eventually tapered off without recurrence of the disease. So her parents were very happy, as was the child. And she did well for a while until a year later when the flares recurred. She came back to see me and in the interval, she had had a growth spurt and such that her current prophylactic dose of acyclovir was insufficient to maintain quiescence. We upped her dose to the adult dosage of 400 milligrams twice daily and uh, she was able to become quiescent after that and stayed on that. So the important lesson that I learned from this case was, especially in children, you have to make sure that your prophylactic dose is appropriate. This is my most recent case of pediatric herpes, which has been quite challenging uh, here in New York. Uh, this is an eight month old girl uh, with a one month history of a red eye. Uh, she was not really diagnosed with herpes uh, during that initial red eye, but um, she was subsequently seen by an outside cornea specialist who was suspicious of herpes and then sent to me. She was on oral acyclovir, topical steroid, topical antibiotics, and topical antiviral. She was found to have a, a persistent epithelial defect as shown here, and she in fact had dramatically reduced sensation because we were able to, um, uh, to test her. Uh, because we know that many topical medications can be toxic to the surface because of their preservatives, I reduced her topical medications, I added ointment, and I asked her parents to tape at night to encourage epithelial healing. Not terribly surprisingly, she couldn't tolerate the taping uh, and came in uh, a week later um, and I placed a bandage contact lens with uh, topical fluoroquinolone prophylactic therapy. The uh, lens came out after 24 hours and the, the PED was now larger and you can see she had some anterior chamber inflammation. Now, of course, we were concerned that this might be infectious and we did culture it, which was negative uh, and uh, leading us to believe that this was all a sequelae from the um, persistent epithelial defect. Uh, we at this point took her to the operating room. You can see here a surgical view of her cornea. Uh, she doesn't have very much corneal thinning at this point. And we did an inlay onlay amniotic membrane uh, the inlay uh, in the area of the defect, the onlay over the entire cornea and sutured uh, at the limbus in a purse string fashion um, using um, uh, 10 nylon. 
Uh, we also performed a suture tarsorophy. Uh, she did very well with this and uh, about 10 days after we performed the surgery, we took her back for an exam under anesthesia, took down the tarsorophy and her epithelium had indeed healed. She did well for about a month, but then had very early breakdown. And uh, it, thankfully in New York, we do have a center that fits the pros lens. And I referred her to Cornell where Michelle Lee, uh, the contact lens optometrist at Cornell was able to place her in a pros device for continuous wear. Uh, and you can see her just uh, from uh, 48 hours of wear, uh, the defect uh, virtually closed. And she's been now maintained on the pros lens uh, and is doing quite well. Her epithelium is intact and uh, she's had no further breakdown. Uh, and of course, whenever we talk about any corneal disease in children, amblyopia management is a key part of the um, uh, treatment. So in summary, uh, herpes simplex keratitis is an important disease in children. A high percentage have stromal disease and this has been shown in multiple studies. There is a high risk of recurrence, <clears throat> also confirmed in multiple studies, and a significant risk of corneal scarring, induced astigmatism, and reduced vision. Oral acyclovir can be used, and you must adjust the dose as the child grows. Uh, there, is, there is experience using long-term acyclovir prophylaxis if there is stromal disease. Of course, in children, you want to be careful with topical steroids and amblyopia management is key. So in conclusion, herpes simplex keratitis uh, can uh, present in many different forms in children. And it's always a good idea to consider it in the differential when you have recurrent disease in the front of the eye in children, uh, no matter what the manifestation. And a trial of acyclovir can be helpful in these very challenging cases. And I too, on behalf of the Cornea Society, would like to extend a cordial invitation to the rescheduled World Cornea Congress, which will take place in preceding the annual Academy of Ophthalmology meeting in September, 2022 uh, in Chicago. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Colby. Excellent presentation. I will invite uh, the other panelists, speakers, uh, to come forward with any questions that you might have. Uh, it's, you know, in, in India, it's difficult for us to understand how you could be treating uh, herpetic keratitis without topical acyclovir because we've had it for years now. But I'm sure, uh, I just wanted to understand, uh, in children, you're still giving systemic acyclovir? Uh, yes. Um, so the, the, a, the antiviral agents that we have available are at least five times a day. And uh, Viroptic, which hardly anyone uses anymore, is nine times a day. Uh, we do not have topical acyclovir ointment. Uh, you know, whenever there's stromal disease, I do tend to give um, oral agents because of the risk because it actually reduces the systemic risk of recurrence. That was shown quite nicely in the head study. Um, so that, that's my rationale for using systemic. And in children, you know, it's probably easy for, easier for mom or dad to get um, medicine in their mouth three times a day than medicine in their eye. Mm -hmm. I have a question, Kathy. Could you speak a little bit more about the use how, how your use of topical steroids differs in a pediatric patient with a pedicaritis versus an adult. You mentioned that they get stromal involvement more often. I think you mentioned that uh, corneal scarring may be more frequent. So that would lend us to think maybe we want to be more aggressive with steroids. Uh, but you, I think on your summary slide said, be cautious with the use of steroids. Can you speak a little more about that? Yes, well, I'm just cautious always with medication in children, you know, because you know, they have a whole lifetime ahead of them. Uh, in general, I, I really have rarely had to use stronger steroids in children and almost always start with lodopredinol or maybe FML, something that is not uh, going to cause, um, a, a have a higher uh, percentage of cataract formation because of the age group. 
Um, I think, you know, stromal keratitis is a very challenging condition to, to treat. And if I were not to get control of it with the, uh, with the soft steroid, I would definitely go to a, a bigger gun. Uh, the thing about um, steroids and stromal keratitis is you do want to stay on enough to keep quiescent. So I try to taper them off very slowly, long and slow. Uh, the lower the dose, the longer the taper. And if someone flares at, as I'm reducing, you know, one step, I don't, I, I stop reducing them and I just keep them on the dose that kept them quiet. Because as you know, every time you have a flare, you have to go back up on the drops. And, you know, I do, I don't, I don't like to cause cataracts in, in children. Nobody does, I guess, unless that's your practice is pediatric cataract surgery. Um, so you will keep these patients and Kathy, like the adult patients, some of them on long-term low dose steroid, maybe every day, every couple days, et cetera, to try to prevent that recurrence. Yeah. Uh, so one that. of the, yeah, one of the first child that I presented stayed on twice week, one, you know, one drop every three days kind of thing. Um, it, it, that can be a very challenging um, schedule to keep with. So I do try to make it practical for the parents as well. Sure. We have other questions from the other speakers. Okay, well, thank you very much for that excellent presentation. We heard first from Dr. Tu, who's the immediate past president of the Coin Society. We just heard from Dr. Colby, who's the current president of the Coin Society. And next will be the president elect of the Coin Society, um, Dr. Benny Jang. If we can bring up his biography uh, slide, if we have that. Dr. Jang is currently professor and chair of the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, University of Maryland in Baltimore, Maryland. He has a wide range of interests, uh, including uh, eye banking, keratoplasty, uh, management of infectious keratitis, et cetera. You see uh, just uh, some of his uh, achievements listed here on the slide. Uh, his topic uh, this, e this morning, this evening for him, uh, this morning for most of you listening, yeah. is should amphotericin be added to corneal preservation media? I don't know in India if you've seen the same uh, rise in post-keratoplasty fungal keratitis and ophthalmitis as we have in the United States, uh, but it's certainly a concern. And Dr. Jang has published several papers looking at the cost effectiveness, the efficacy, et cetera, of antifungal supplementation, and that's gonna be his topic today. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, I'll share my slide here. I appreciate the introduction. Okay, so um, I assume everybody can see my slides. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. So um, I was asked to talk about amphotericin, actually a volunteer to talk about amphotericin. So it's a little bit of a different topic um, in this symposium compared to the other talks, but I think it's a very important one. Um, these are my uh, disclosures. I don't have any relevant financial interests, but uh, some of the research I'll talk about briefly um, has come from the EBA and site life in the past. So. Um, I think it's important in order to answer the question of should we add amphotericin into storage media, we really need to see what the problem is and where the need lies. And so if we go back to 1991 or the very, very early 1990s, um, when they were looking at post keratoplasty infection, specifically endophthalmitis in this case, which is obviously a very feared um, condition. Back then, 90% of cases of post-keratoplasty and ophthalmitis were due to bacterial agents. So only 10% were fungal. But then you can, as you can see, through, as the decade progressed, more and more percentage of fungal cases were showing up relative to uh, bacterial cases. So by 2003, 60% of the cases were fungal in etiology. And so you can see here the, the graph of that. But you can't really tell you know, if the cases are going up or down in general, unless you actually look at the total number of cases. And if you look here, you can see that starting in 1991, the general trend towards 2006 is a downward trend in terms of the number of cases of endophthalmitis post keratoplasty. And then in 2006, it started to go up. So what can we hypothesize that occurred in 1991 or around thereabouts? Well, that was uh, coincided with the introduction of um, Optisol GS, Optisol and then Optisol GS, which contains broad spectrum antibiotics. 
And that probably coupled with better uh, ways of sanitizing the, the corneas before storage all contributed to lower infection rates. Uh, kept going down until 2006, keep that date in mind, and then started to rise. If we look even closer at both endophthalmitis and infectious keratitis cases in blue added together, you can see starting in 2001 for the last two decades, um, you can see that the trend goes downward to 2006 and then starts to creep up and creeped up to a point in 2017, very, very high, and then has dropped in the last few years. But the trend from 2006 is upward. And if you look at the, um, the controlled uh, infection rate per 10,000 graphs, you can see that it follows the general trend. So what's going on here? If we take even a closer look, you can see 2006 still sticks out as a very important year. Um, 2006 and before, the teal colored bars, which is fungus, is comprises less than 50% of the cases of endophthalmitis pathogens, mostly it's bacteria. But then after 2006, you see it's almost all teal. Almost all cases of endophthalmitis were caused by fungus. So what's, what is going on here? Well, we've all seen this graph from the EBAA. And you know most people show this to show that in 2011, EK took over from PK as the more commonly performed keratoplasty procedure done in the US. But I wanna bring you back to 2006, what I talked about. And 2006 is the steep, steepest rise in terms of the rate of uh, EK cases being done in the US. And it, that trend continued to go upwards and still is. EK uh, is more popular and more commonly done than PK. So can we correlate that? Can we actually say that the rising cases and specifically with fungus is due to rising EK being done? You can't really do that unless you actually control for the rates uh, of the two different types of keratoplasty. And if you do that, you look here in the red is the PK fungal infection rate per 10,000 cases compared to the, uh, in green, the EK fungal infection rate per 10,000 cases. And here you can see that the rate is higher for EK. So why is that? And what is that? Well, this is a, a case that Barry Lee allowed me to show uh, a fungal ball growing in the interface Perhaps this is a little bit clearer to see that it's in their interface. I borrowed this from Luigi Fontana. And if not taken care of um, in various methods, and that's a subject for another lecture, um, it can progress to something like this and then become endophthalmitis. So we definitely have a problem on our hands. Um, and the literature will support that. There's these and many other published cases of infectious keratitis from fungus in the interface from endothelial keratoplasty. And so we have that problem, and it seems like we have an obvious reason for it. And the reason in the US is that Optosol GS, which is the most commonly used corneal storage media still currently, you know, two to three decades later, contains gentamicin and streptomycin, has done a good job with antibacterial action, but does not contain an antifungal. And the calimetric indicator that's in the uh, Optosol GS does not reliably detect candida applicants contamination. And so and we don't have time to test it before we release it for use. Even the newer storage media, Life4C, which came around in 2011, also still only has gentamicin and streptomycin and doesn't have an antifungal. Now in Europe and in other places that use organ culture storage at 34 degrees or up to 37 degrees, they have antibiotics and they generally have amphotericin in some concentration as low as 0.25 micrograms per mil. Now the rates of fungal endophthalmitis from tissue used in organ culture is actually lower. It is a little bit deceiving though, because it's not, not necessarily because of the antifungal that's added in there, because of the way that you can test tissue before you release it, um, tissue can be found to be contaminated, not released and then discarded. And so that's what happens. But you know, does amphotericin being added in there reduce the number of, of uh, corneas that actually become discarded because of contamination? I don't know that we know the answer. And maybe those cases that have uh, that been discarded, if higher concentration of amphotericin is in it, maybe they wouldn't be discarded. We don't know that, but, but it's certainly something we should look into. Now, what's happening in the US for hypothermic storage media? Well, this is one of the first papers that actually really looked at adding antifungals into the currently available storage media. And this is from 2007. I wanna highlight David Ritterban and his group for, for doing this. They looked at adding voriconazole into Optosol GS and then culturing um, a whole bunch of corneal rims, 533 that they cut in half and stored each in uh, voriconazole supplemented versus non 
supplemented Opisol GS and found that uh, voriconazole supplemented Opisol GS was able to reduce um, uh, po positive cultures for fungal growth um, down to zero from seven in the other group. Now, not a lot was done from that, that point on for a while. And in this report from the IBank Association of America uh, Medical Advisory Board Subcommittee on Fungal Infection After Corneal Transplantation, at that time in 2013, actually did not recommend that the story, storage media should be uh, supplemented with an antifungal agent at that time. And the reasons for uh, arriving at this decision were because of lack of sufficient evidence regarding the efficacy and safety, as well as the cost effectiveness of antifungal supplementation. Now, there just wasn't a lot of data out there. There was the one study from David Ritterband, uh, and there wasn't that much else. But around that same time, um, our group and others began looking at um, antifungal supplementation in storage media. Now, I prefer to use amphotericin when I have a, um, a candidal infection, and so we looked at that and voriconazole, and in our model of looking at the storage media that's been inoculated with uh, candida, uh, voriconazole didn't perform nearly as well as amphotericin, and amphotericin was actually able to eradicate at even low, low doses all of the antifungal contaminants that we tested for. Now, unfortunately, we tested media. And so a criticism of our, our model is that it wasn't actually testing um, corneal scleral rims, for example, where you would actually culture. And so a few years later, uh, the group from Pittsburgh actually looked at um, inoculating corneal scleral uh, rims with uh, candida and then immersing them in octosol that's supplemented with low dose, what we use 0.255 micrograms per mil of amphotericin B. And what they actually found was that it was not effective at clearing uh, the candida when inoculated on the sclera. So the tissue model is definitely different than the just using the, the storage media. The other uh, criticism of what we did um, was that we didn't control for what actually happens in the eye bank. And it, the eye bank doesn't hold the media just at uh, four degrees, four to eight degrees Celsius. Um, there is uh, warming that is done um, before specular microscopy and then before tissue processing. And Elmer too and his group um, looked at this and looked at how temperature warming can actually have a significantly detrimental effect on, um, on the tissue from a microbiologic standpoint because the fungi are actually able to replicate uh, exponentially during these warming times. And so that was something that we also did not control for in our study. Now, um, what, what can we do and what can we think about that might, might actually help with those two things? Well, if there's more fungi, then maybe you need higher concentration, right? And if there's, uh, if there's tissue that's contaminated that might be harder to get rid of, maybe a higher concentration would work. And so Mark Reinert and Quatran and, and their colleagues here looked at higher concentrations of amphotericin in storage media. And when you compare what we did with 0.255, that's the triangle that's down here, you can get about 90% in their study, 90% clearance of the of colony forming units of Canada. Whereas to get 99.9%, .9%, you had to be up here uh, 1.25 or 2.5 or even five micrograms per mil. Five is approaching toxicity, at least from our preliminary work. And so you need to be up at a much higher concentration than we tested. There's actually uh, an interesting product that is, is, is coming out um, or has just come out called Kerasave. Um, one of the problems with amphotericin is that's unstable. So you can't just put it into solution and then dispense it over the year um, uh, after you've made the storage media. Um, it breaks down, it, uh, it, it degrades with light. Um, and so this is actually a tablet that's, that's put in um, at the time that the cornea is put in and yields a concentration of 2.5 micrograms per mil, a higher concentration than we studied, but one that was shown to be uh, to eradicate 99.9% .9 of organisms. And you can see here for many strains, not glabrata, but for uh, albicans and tropicalis, um, it was able to uh, completely eradicate the colonies. Okay, now the biggest question that we've had for a very long time is safety. Um, a lot of studies have looked at safety, but with very, very small numbers, just a, a couple of pairs here and there looking at endothelial uh, function um, and, and structure. This uh, study using Kerasave uh, compared to Optisol actually looked at a lot of parameters and a lot of corneas, not just a couple, a small handful, looking at endothelial cell density, 
uh, central corneal thickness, the transparency of the cornea, the polymorphism, endothelial cell borders, and basically found that there was no difference compared to optosol. And from this study, they deemed that the 2.5 microgram per mil concentration was indeed actually safe. So how about cost effectiveness? Well, this was one of two cost effectiveness studies that have been published in the last year. Um, and this one determined that um, the supplementation with amphotericin uh, was cost effective at a, at a level of 100,000 US dollars per quality. Um, the couple of important caveats here is that they are, they are looking at an efficacy of 70%. And they're also taking in consideration the incidence of these fungal infections during the years from 2012 to 2017. So on the graph early on, where I showed you where the incidences have dropped off, maybe this will push it so that it, it is not quite as cost effective. But using those numbers, um, they deem that uh, supplementation with amphotericin is cost effective. And this paper that was published in the Blue Journal uh, came to similar conclusions just looking at different parameters finding that amphotericin is the cheapest one um, and the most cost-effective one to use. Okay, so I, I would be remiss if I didn't admit to the fact that there are other things out there that help with uh, antifungal uh, action. Um, and one thing that was published by Barry Lee and his colleagues from the Georgia Eye Bank is the use of povidone iodine exposure uh, times and doubling them when harvesting the cornea. So eye banks traditionally have exposed corneas from two to five minutes with betadine, a povidone iodine, and then rinse it off and then harvest the cornea. What they proposed is actually doing two five minute washes separated by five minutes before harvesting the cornea. And when they looked at the transplants that were done in their centers, so 631 of them, before they changed their protocol, um, they had uh, two, fungal infections, they had 12 positive fungal rims, okay? And after they changed the protocol of the 725 uh, cases that were done, they had only two positive fungal rims and zero uh, fungal infections. And just taking a look at the percentages, you can see the positive fungal rims from before the change in protocol went from 3% down to 0.5%, uh, I'm sorry, 3% uh, down to 0.6%. And clinical fungal infections drop from 0.5% to zero. Now, with a positive rate here, um, that tells us that you know that you get false negatives all the time. So there still is fungus that is not necessarily covered by this procedure. And sooner or later, you can still get a, a clinical fungal infection. And so the question is, do we think that we should still supplement then just to cover those? Um, particular ones. Now, I'll tell you that the Cornea Journal um, invited a number of us to write pro-con uh, uh, stances, uh, editorials on different topics related to this, and uh, I had the pleasure of going uh, against my usual sparring partner, uh, Dr. Elmer Tu, who's on the line here, um, who argued against uh, antifungal supplementation. You can tell that I'm arguing for it. And he cited three main things. One is that the rate of um, fungal infection in Europe uh, being lower is not because of amphotericin in organ culture. And, and I talked about that already. It is because they are able to discard tissue, but potentially a higher concentration of antifungals might prevent more tissue from being discarded. The warming of tissue for processing was not addressed. And I did address that that was a shortcoming of our study. And he says that safer and more cost-effective interventions are already bearing fruit. And that's what the povidone uh iodine flushes, um, which um, again, is good, but doesn't completely eradicate everything. So do we want to still supplement? And that's the question. And I just wanna say that uh, uh, Dr. Tu slyly uh, was able to use my own words against me in his editorial that argued against me. So in conclusion, I just wanna say that I hope you can see that post endothelial keratoplasty fungal infection are a real problem. Now there are various methods to decrease this rate with disinfection at the time of procurement being a big one that has just come around. But the addition of antifungals into storage can still offer protection and still and seems to be safe with further studies that we've seen. But I think it needs to be at a higher concentration than initially believed, at least at 2.5 micrograms per mil. Um, the more research that I think that is needed is looking at safety with regard to actual clinical outcomes um, after keratoplasty to see if, how, if there's a problem with longevity of the tissue. And so to answer the question, should amphotericin be added to corneal preservation media? Yes, it should, once we confirm safety in clinical trials. If you've missed anything, this is my editorial, you can look up. And in following the uh, 
past president and president of the Cornea Society, I also want to extend my uh, hearty welcome and uh, invitation to attend World Cornea Congress 8 in Chicago. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jang. Excellent comprehensive presentation. Um, wondering if your sparring partner has any comments or rebuttal or anything that he'd like to echo. Well, I would point out at the iBank Association meeting last week uh, or two weeks ago that Marjan Farid presented her study looking at 2.5 micrograms uh, and it did not eradicate uh, the fungal positive rims. I mean, it reduced it by a small amount, but it wasn't effective at eradicating all of the fungus. So I think if you're looking for real world evidence, there it is right there is that uh, there have been infections in patients who have had supplemented uh, Optazol GS and there also have been uh, a similar number of positive fungal rims. So I, I think that at this point, I, I don't think amphotericin is the answer. And those cost effectiveness studies basically showed that amphotericin was the only one that could be cost effective. All the other ones were not. Yeah, we are, as uh, you know, interested in looking at post DMAC fungal infections. We just became aware of the 34th and 35th cases. And out of that number, three were corneas stored in uh, antifungals. Also, what we need is the denominator. Uh, what's the incidence of fungal infection, those that are stored in antifungal versus those that are not? We don't have that information. But to echo what you just said, Elmer, obviously putting it in a preservation medium with antifungal does not guarantee against the recipient developing an infection. Curious as to how many people here, the speakers, are requesting supplementation of the preservation medium currently with antifungal. Is anybody? Not me. Guillermo? No. No. I'm, okay. I'm... Dr. Colby is shaking her head no. Dr. Tu, no. Benny, I think from your talk, sounds like you will, but once we have more data. I will. I'm trying to run a clinical trial, actually. Are you? Good. Good to see you using your time wisely. <laughs> uh, Namrata or Dr. Reina in India. Um, are, are any surgeons requesting, or is it available uh, to request antifungal supplementation of the storage media? I don't know if Dr. Reina is with us, but um, I'm not. I'm not aware of any of my Indian colleagues. Um, actually, Dr. Reina, I think, is on now. I'm not aware of any Indian colleagues asking for antifungal supplementation, but maybe you can tell us if it's available. Uh, so sorry, sorry to uh, interrupt you, Dr. Anthony, uh, but I am I am not a doctor. I am the uh, hall coordinator for this hall. Oh, <laughs> very good. Okay. Tony, well, if I can I... make a quick comment, the, apparently candida infections are rare uh, in India, and uh, it's probably because most of the tissue is surgeon prepared, um, and so they they seldom see candida infections anywhere. Uh, their problem, their primary problem, honestly, is uh, resistant bacterial infections. And so, uh, but candida is a very, very uncommon, to my understanding, uh, in India. I, I, I think you're right. Obviously, the SCUT study showed us that mainly it's filamentous fungi that are problematic. Uh, but I do believe that at least there, and I may be wrong here, but I think uh, my good friend Samar Basak, many years ago, maybe he published a paper looking at post keratoplasty fungal infections, eyes on topical steroids chronically, and they were predominantly Canada in, in India. So I think in some populations like that group, post keratoplasty infections, they are still seeing Canada. But I think like I said, overall, I think the burden is mainly with due to filamentous fungi. Well, we're going to now move to another uh, subject in this uh, symposium regarding uh, strategies for prevention and management of infectious keratitis in challenging situations. And Dr. Guillermo Mesqua is going to deliver our next talk. If we can have his uh, summary slide up. Dr. Mesqua is an associate professor of clinical ophthalmology and director of the Ocular Surface Center at the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute in Miami. Uh, he has multiple areas of expertise and interest, uh, two of them being ocular immunology and microbiology as well as ocular surface uh, reconstruction. Um, he has published uh, on what I think is a very interesting area, which is the use of Rose Bengal photodynamic uh, therapy for treating progressive infectious keratitis. And uh, he'll talk a bit about 
the use of this technique for refractory keratitis. Dr. Mesqua. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tony, for the invitation. And thank you, to Dr. Sharma, also for uh, letting me speak on this topic that it's been uh, worked uh, for many years now. Um, and thank you for the Cornea Society uh, for letting me participate. Um, yes, like uh, Dr. Olave said, I'm going to talk about the use of Rose Bengal uh, for patients with progressive um, keratitis. Uh, for my financial disclosures, I, I don't have a financial interest. I do uh, own part of the patent of the light source that we use. Uh, and uh, what I'm presenting is uh, experimental and is a, a not yet FDA approved. Uh, we're trying really hard, but not yet. Um, this has been a total teamwork. Uh, I work, uh, I'm very lucky to work under the leadership of Dr. John Marie Perel and many others, and uh, lucky to have uh, my boss and mentors uh, that have been supporting me this project uh, for now years. So living in South Florida is like living on a Petri dish. So we see a lot of keratitis and um, many patients come from, from far away, from the Caribbean islands, from uh, out of state, et cetera, with progressive keratitis. And uh, um, this is, these are our um, culture positivity rates and, and, and the organisms are, are our enemies that I call uh, gram negatives by far the most common because of the tropical weather. Uh, we do see a significant amount of fungi and keratitis and uh, you can see here the rest of my atypicals. So um, if, if you look, if you go back and look at this publication, it's very interesting, 1973 from Dr. Dan Jones. And uh, this publication, you read it, and we're in 2021, and we are still doing many things the same. Uh, many, many antibiotics that he mentions are the ones that we use. I, uh, in my career, haven't seen many new antibiotics develop. We're still using the same commercially available antifungal, natamycin. Uh, we do use some compounding uh, antifungals, but um, there's, there's not a lot of tools for many aggressive organisms that we see. So this publication, Dr. Jones, uh, and the strategies that he mentions are, are strategies that we're still using, like trusting a gram stain or trusting a calcofluor white uh, to decide our treatment. So I think if you, know, if you have a practice with a, a, a significant amount of um, infectious keratitis, we can summarize it by saying that for bacterial and for viral disease, we, we, we have a pretty good uh, way to treat them. Um, we, we, if you have access to fortified antibiotics and the patient is compliant, they if you catch it early, the patients will probably gonna do just fine. And, uh, but for atypical bacteria, not so good. And for fungal and parasitic, we still have a lot of room to work. And, and and these are the cases that we see. This is a typical Friday afternoon at 4.30 p.m. when the resident comes and tells you that it has a red eye that needs help. And, you know, so the, the, the infection is going to the sclera. The cornea has half the thickness that it should be. And you do, and you're excited early in your career to do therapeutic keratoplasty, but then you have to follow this patient. They develop glaucoma, and you develop graft rejections. And um, so, you know, this is what, uh, the project's all about, try to eliminate or decrease the number of patients that we have to take to the operating room for a, a um, uh, therapeutic transplant. So um, when I joined the faculty after my fellowship, uh, this was very popular. The cross-linking was getting approved in the U.S. and it was very popular in the rest of the, the world for corticonus. And it was demonstrated with significant evidence. Uh, that uh, there was an increased resistance to enzymatic degradation that would make the collagen fibers better. So uh, we started to ask the question, can we use this cross-linking with riboflavin and UV light to uh, help the problem that we have in South Florida? And um, we, uh, Dr. John Marie Perel and his team of engineers built for us a custom-made uh, light source following the resident protocol. And this was uh, one of the first uh, patients that we treated with a fulminant pseudomonas, as a young female. And uh, we used uh, this device that was uh, uh, made by, uh, built by Dr. Uh, Perel. And uh, you can see here that the, the patient normally will develop this significant neovascularization. They'll start healing uh, the disease and stopping the melting. And we see this frequently in, uh, in patients that we treat with uh, either uh, cross-linking or uh, are now PDT for dynamic therapy. 
And this is what we want. We want to do a transplant when the eye looks like this. We don't want to do a transplant when the eye is very inflamed. And all here, everyone here is in agreement that the prognosis will be so much better if you do the transplant in a quiet eye. And this has been the case with this patient that I still follow many, many years later. Uh, she was one of the first patients, like I said, and she refracts with a good vision and the graphs is still good. Um, then there's, there's a lot of conflicting uh, data on the efficacy of, of using cross-linking. I'm talking about riboflavin with UV light. A recent publication from the group of the Proctor Foundation under the leadership of Dr. Uh, Jennifer Rose uh, show that the results are not, not, in, not incredibly good for, for the use of riboflavin, maybe decreasing the rate of uh, positivity on the cultures and maybe decreasing some complications. Uh, this study, uh, uh, it's, uh, it helped to bring another study that may happen, that's happening now, now in Arvin and hopefully soon in the next month, we'll start recruiting here in our center where we're going to use cross-linking with riboflavin to see if we can help some of these bacterial infections. The group from Dr. Hafezi has done a, 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 a good job uh, trying to uh, move this technology forward to see if we can help patients with infectious keratitis. Um, and they, been, they published uh, that using a higher fluence uh, may help improve the outcomes. We used to uh, use uh, UV light and we um, published our results uh, and with some, some, some benefit in some of the patients. But when we started doing our in vitro studies, we started looking at different photosensitizing agents. And we decided on Rose Bengal for obvious reasons. One is inexpensive. It's, we have a long uh, track record of safety in ophthalmology. So we decided to start doing that. It happens that Rose Bengal is a very strong photosensitizing agent. It releases a lot of single oxygen. And uh, we, were, we were not doing anything new. We, there was a lot, there were many groups uh, publishing on how uh, Rose Bengal can increase uh, collagen, uh, uh, the stiffness of the collagen fibers. And uh, it's been shown to be safe in the use of, in, in, in an animal model, in a rabbit model by the group in Spain and by the group of Dr. Koshibar in Boston. So. We felt comfortable bringing this technology. We, uh, we built the light source, they custom made, and we started doing our in vitro data. And uh, this uh, is one of our first publications that gave a lot of, injected a lot of energy to our group uh, to start moving forward where we compare with riboflavin and UV light. And for our three most common uh, fungal organisms, we had 100% kill in the area of irradiations, Candida, Aspergillus, and Fusarium. And the same has happened with uh, many other bugs that we tested, multi-drug resistant methicillin, resistant staph aureus and multidrug resistant pseudomonas. We started doing uh, uh, research uh, on how safe this was uh, for the ocular surface. Uh, do, are we going to damage the limbal stem cells? And with this scratch model on a, uh, on a rabbit, uh, treating the right eye and using the left eye as control, we didn't see any issues with healing of the epithelium. And then we asked the question, are we doing any, any, any uh, damage to the endothelium? And I personally uh, debated with uh, Dr. Perella saying, you know, I really don't, not that I don't care, but it, I'd rather just stop the infection and do the transplant when the eye is quiet. If, we, if the endothelium suffers and we stop the infection, to me, it's still a win, but we have to do things the right way and we have to follow FDA guidelines. And, and we did it and there was no, in a, in a healthy uh, rabbit model, there was no, um, no damage. So we recently published in the Journal of Cornea uh, uh, a in vitro uh, uh, study showing again uh, good safety in using uh, the, the our protocol. Uh, we analyzed um, the the tissues inside the eye, the, the lens, uh, the retina, the iris, and there was no no problem. This was our first publication. This patient uh, came desperate with a uh, uh, rapid progressive fusarium um, infection that was not responding to the standard medical care, and it happens that we use her sample for one of our um, in vitro studies and we show 100% healing and um, she uh, is, is very smart and read some of the publications and asked us to do it. We got the proper consent and we did it. And, um, and she ended up uh, 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 healing that cornea and later on receiving an optical transplant. So we put together um, all of our results, uh, our results uh, uh, that we had at that time. This is the publication for almost two years ago, a year and a half ago. And uh, uh, where uh, we, uh, we feel that we stop or prevented many patients from going to the operating room. Now it's, very, it's not a very, very scientific way to, uh, to do this because we basically started doing it in patients who had very severe disease uh, because of the regulatory issues around this. Um, but recently we partnered with a company um, that makes um, medical grade uh, Rose Bengal 
and uh, we are doing a formal collaboration with a new um, um, grant from the University of Miami in collaboration with them. And we're starting to uh, um, um, test this, this rose bengal that's coming from them. The company is called Provectus, and um, it, it, it gets activated with the same wavelength of the ones that we use. Um, we've done uh, all the chemical analysis and uh, to show uh, that is uh, pure and, 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 and enough quality to, to be used. Of course, it's been used in, for, for in that company for other oncological indications. It's been used in the form of IV, so we feel comfortable using it in the form of uh, topical treatment. So we repeated a lot, of, uh, a lot of experiments that we've already done with the Sigma Rose Bengal, and we've been pretty happy uh, with the results. Uh, we did all the in vitro studies that um, you've seen before, and they've been uh, already published in, uh, this is a Candida, this is Fusarium, uh, comparing Provectus with the Sigma um, Rose Bengal. And, um, and Waspergillus is the one that we, uh, we've been uh, surprised that uh, we've been, we've not been getting uh, the results we wanted uh, recently. So we are studying the different uh, uh, types of Waspergillus. Uh, and also we repeated our animal data, uh, our animal studies with, uh, with the, uh, this new uh, medical grade rose bengal. And we haven't seen any issues in epithelial healing using um, uh, this, um, this rose bengal. Uh, one of our engineer uh, students, uh, uh, MD PhD students, uh, uh, got interested in this in, in this project, and he he amazingly uh, uh, developed uh, in, in in under the mentorship of Dr. Perel a device that can detect and measure how much single oxygens is being released when you're doing the treatment, and this is going to help us um, titrate uh, what's the what's a better dose. Um, uh, for, for the treatment, what's the, uh, the duration that the treatment should have. There's so many questions that we still need to answer. So credit here is to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Peterson, uh, who soon will be applying to a residency position. So a few uh, uh, program directors, uh, um, he, he really has done a great job. So this is a recent case. And, you know, I, I, I've always tried to um, remain as unbiased as possible with this project. But this case, to me, really prove that we, we, we've saved some patients from going into, uh, uh, into surgery. This is a patient that um, is from Argentina that got stuck here in Miami during the pandemia. He had no flights. He was extending his use of contact lenses. So in June last year, he showed up with this fulminant serratia. Um, the attending at that time felt that the infection may be also involving the sclera. It was not blanching with phenylephrine. The patient was in severe pain. So they were already scheduling surgery and um, uh, one of the residents proposed to the patient uh, the option of, um, of doing this procedure and, and we did it. And the patient um, eventually healed and, and, and left back to Ar uh, Argentina. Uh, he, his epithelium healed, pain went away. And he came recently uh, back for follow-up and I was just so amazed uh, how this cornea looked. Look and see you know, how the cornea looked be, be before treatment and how the cornea looked uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I did cataract surgery uh, last Tuesday on him and uh, his, his, his vision is actually pretty decent. So I don't, we're not thinking on doing any keroplasty on this, on this patient. So, um, uh, so far, you know, um, the, the patients that we've seen the best results have been patients with very severe gram negative infections uh, patients surprisingly with a with we've been we've been unlucky to uh, or not not uh, very good results in vitro with a but uh, clinically we've seen uh, many patients that turn around uh, and um, we're not very happy actually with the results of the fungal keratitis and 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 it's interesting because that's the main reason we started this project. But one of the reasons may be that we are treating the patients very in, uh, when they present uh, very severe with very deep in infections. The, 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 the uh, fungal uh, patients that we've treated and, and in the early uh, stages of the disease, patients with uh, infections in the, in, in the first uh, in the anterior part of the cornea um, have done actually pretty, pretty well. Um, but most of our failures have been very severe fusarium or aspergillus uh, 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 infections. So in summary, I think we, we, we all can agree that we need better treatments for infectious keratitis. Um, we hope that this uh, Rose Bengal for dynamic therapy may be a future option for the treatment of infectious keratitis. There's many questions that we still need to answer. 
Um, you know, how much is this photosensitizing penetrating in, in the cornea? We know that it penetrates in a healthy cornea and a healthy rabbit cornea to about 120 to 150 microns. What's the fluence that we need to use? The timing of the treatment, the number of the treatments, and uh, are there other photosensitizing agents that could be more potent? Um, and so those are the questions. And I thank you very much for uh, letting me uh, present our, our research. Thank you very much uh, for that insightful presentation. Um, really cutting edge treatment. I will open up for other speakers who may have questions for you. If not, I, I have one. Um, and that is, as you know, I've consulted you a few months ago regarding one of my uh, patients with a refractory acanthamoeba keratitis, asking whether he, you thought he'd be a candidate uh, for this treatment. And I guess based on your experience so far, when, are you, when do you think it's appropriate in a patient with acanthamoeba to consider doing Rosemangol PDT? Are you tending now to, based on your experience, do a little bit earlier? I think in your published series, you had several patients who developed perforations shortly after treatment. So are you more hesitant to do this in patients already have significant stromal thinning? Or what, how has your treatment algorithm changed based on the experience you've gained thus far? Um, thank you, Tony. That, that, that's a, a, a good question and, and actually an excellent question. I, I don't know if, if I can answer, but I'll, I'll be as honest as possible. So the, we first started treating patients that two cornea specialists will agree that the next step was um, surgical. We were very surprised with many patients that we felt that the eye just was not going to do well, and it actually ended up doing very well. And to add, and we added the, the 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 safety data that we had, the the fact that we didn't have any issues with the pa first patients that we treated. So we been relaxing the indication. So it, it now it's very common that I get a call from the residents on a daily basis or weekly basis that can you use this. Uh, so uh, we, we, we can't just offer it to everyone. We have to follow, uh, we have to follow rules and, and, and we, we've been relaxing the, the indications. And these patients that you mentioned that had uh, perforations were also patients that were started on miltefusine. And uh, I don't know if it was the PDT, I don't know if it was the miltefusine, but we, we learned uh, that, uh, to use anti-inflammatory therapy in the miltefusine. The first miltefusine patients we treated uh, developed horrible inflammation and then developed white corneas and then eventually uh, uh, melted. What I can tell you is that the patients that required a, a, a graft in the acute setting still have a clear graft. And we don't know how to answer that. Uh, there is a group in Germany uh, doing research uh, with cross-linking and different uh, photosensitization agents showing that you can uh, make a high-risk graft, a less high-risk graft, and we're really happy with those results. Um, but it's, we haven't had very good standardization of the cases. We've had multiple organisms, so it's really hard to study and to answer your question. This is why uh, we're partnering with, with LB Prasad and with Arbin to do a prospective study. We are uh, working with uh, Proctor to start uh, a new NIH sponsored trial that's going to study this prospectively. So I, I'm not, I'm not going to endorse this treatment until I see a prospective study with a control because it can be just, you know, anecdotal data. And, 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 but, but there are many cases that we've been surprised that we are sure that the patients were not going to do well and they did. So, but, May I ask a quick question, Guillermo? Yeah, no, for sure. This is really exciting. I think you're doing great work on this. Um, Thank you. You know, with cross-linking, I guess one of the, you know, collagen cross-linking, one of the questions was whether or not some of the improvement was from eradication of inflammatory elements versus actually eradication of the bug. I mean, bacterial, mm -hmm. you should be able to sterilize them, but and the result that you just showed um, do you think some of that effect was really more from collagen stabilization or was it all anti-microbial well uh, great question i think i think in this very severe uh, uh gram negatives as you know and the severe streptococcus infections that have rapid melting i think there's definitely some anti-inflammatory effect uh, and i think there's something uh, and we are studying our pathology samples to look at lymphatics we haven't had a good way to uh, look for them but we, we feel that there may be something in the architecture of those lymphatics and and and, and something with inflammatory 
blood vessels because the the patients get less inflammation. And if you end up doing a transplant, either a therapeutic or an optical, they do well. We we we're putting together all of our our our, our transplants. And it's really incredible that many of these patients have severe neovascularization and inflammation, and they're still clear. Uh, I, and we just follow regular, you know, we're not using tacrolimus or anything, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's an anti-inflammatory and there is a, a, an antimicrobial, but yeah, there, we need, there's too many things that we need to study still. Well, thank you very much. We'll uh, move on then to the last speaker, uh, who is myself, if we can put up uh, my slide. Um, I am a, a professor of ophthalmology at the Steiner Institute in Los Angeles, uh, California, uh, where I've been now for uh, 19 years. Uh, my interests are corneal genetics and uh, keratoprosthesis surgery. And uh, we can allow me to share my screen now. The subject of my talk will be uh, regarding keratoprosthesis surgery, specifically uh, management of microbial uh, keratitis in patients with keratoprosthesis. And let me see here. Are you seeing, um, let me make sure, I don't think you're seeing the screen I wanna share. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, you're good. Yes. Very good. All right. So infectious keratitis. And some, some would argue that all infectious keratitis in patients with Boston keratoprosthesis is complicated uh, because often it is difficult to obtain a, a culture and difficult to manage uh, because many times the infection, I think, forms a biofilm on the optic of the keratoprosthesis. Uh, by way of disclosure, I have no financial interest relevant to uh, what I'll discuss during this presentation. So we published uh, a paper about now eight years ago in, the, uh, in ophthalmology regarding microbial keratitis in the Boston K-Pro patients. And one thing we looked at was whether the incidence of infectious keratitis was higher in eyes with history of cicatrizing conjunct conjunctivitis as compared to those without. And we did not see a significant difference in the incidence, although others uh, like uh, Ed Holland have reported uh, a difference. We thought maybe the, the failure to identify a difference is because we, we didn't have a large number of cases of infectious keratitis uh, in this series. So we decided it makes sense to go ahead and collect a larger number of cases uh, with longer follow-up to try to determine the incidence of infectious keratitis following Boston K-Pro implantation, uh, the risk factors, um, as well as how these patients do after treatment to develop, try to develop some evidence-based based guidelines for management of infectious keratitis following capro implantation. So this was a retrospective uh, consecutive case series of capro procedures performed, as you see on the slide, uh, during a, about a 15-year period. Uh, these are cases that uh, were identified by Mona Harisha Dagar at University of Montreal and myself. You'll notice that the post-operative antimicrobial regimen differed a bit between Los Angeles and Montreal. In uh, Los Angeles, uh, I typically use a fourth generation fluoroquinolone four times a day indefinitely. Uh, I used to use vancomycin uh, post-op, but stopped doing that about eight years ago. In Montreal, a fourth generation fluoroquinolone is used four times daily after surgery but it is tapered down to one or two times daily and then continued indefinitely. The post-operative regimen uh, uh, at both uh, University of Montreal and UCLA did not employ the use of topical antifungals. Topical steroids were used, but then were tapered down to one or two times daily. And in fact, usually I'll discontinue unless there's some reason to continue a steroid such as a history of uveitis. Uh, therapeutic soft contact lenses were placed after surgery to facilitate uh, maintaining intact epithelium in patients who, who had, let's say, limbal stem cell deficiency. In some patients uh, who were more comfortable with a contact lens, we kept one on. Or in some patients who felt that the vision was better, we maintained them in a contact lens. But unless they had one of these indications for long-term wear of a contact lens, we did not continue it in majority of patients. And when a patient was wearing a contact lens, it was exchanged usually every month 
uh, sometimes uh, as infrequently as every three months. So in this series, we examined uh, 349 keratoprosthesis procedures performed in, as you see on the slide, almost 300 eyes of 268 patients. Uh, the mean age uh, was 63, and the duration of follow-up in this series was a little over four years. So if you look at the total number of eyes that we've monitored and the, over the duration of follow-up, we're looking at over 1,500 years of cumulative follow-up. So I think with that amount of data, we can actually come to some conclusions regarding, again, incidents and uh, management and outcomes. Um, so as far as the results, uh, compared to the Montreal series, the UCLA series had a significantly higher proportion of eyes with graft failure as the indication for the uh, keratoprosthesis. Also, and compared to Montreal series, the UCLA series had a significantly higher proportion of eyes with prior K-Pro implantation, as you see here on the slide, 21%. Uh, versus 10%. However, the Montreal series had a significantly higher percentage of eyes with aniridia as the indication for K-Pro implantation as compared to the series at UCLA. So there were some differences uh, between these series, but in both, the most common indication was graft failure, and that's true for any really any series of keratoprostheses. Um, we identified 57 cases of presumed infectious keratitis after 53 procedures in 50 eyes of 49 patients. So you say, what's the, how many, what percentage of eyes develop infectious keratitis? Well, in this series, it was around 17%. Four cases were identified of recurrent keratitis in the same donor cornea. And there were three cases of recurrent keratitis in different donors' corneas in the same eye. So somebody have a keratoprosthesis, they get an infection, cornea melt, we take out the K-Pro, put in another keratoprosthesis with a new donor cornea, then it gets an infectious keratitis. And there was one case, as you note on the slide, of a patient, unfortunately, who developed infectious keratitis in both eyes. The annual incidence of infectious keratitis after Boston K-Pro implantation in this series was 0.035 cases per year. The annual incidence of culture positive bacterial keratitis, as you see, was about three times as high as the annual incidence of culture positive fungal keratitis. So the annual incidence of presumed infectious keratitis of 0.035 cases per year corresponded to development of one case of infectious keratitis per about 29 years of follow-up. The incidence of bacterial keratitis, uh, 0.014 per year, corresponded to one case for every 71 years of follow-up. And that was significantly higher than the instance after fung a fungal keratitis, which is 0.004 per year, corresponding to one case of fungal keratitis for every 250 years of follow-up. When the instance of presumed and culture-proven infectious keratitis in the UCLA series was evaluated, you see it's 0.45, uh, it's significantly higher uh, than that in the uh, Montreal series. Uh, uh, there was, however, no difference in the incidence of bacterial or fungal keratitis between the UCLA or Montreal series when those were evaluated separately. Uh, as expected, bacterial keratitis was more common than fungal keratitis at both centers. Obviously, this is how North America differs uh, from India, with a significant difference in the Montreal series, uh, but not in the UCLA series. The mean time to infectious development of infectious keratitis, as you note, was about 20 months. So you say, when does it usually develop? Well, as you see, it's a wide range, but typically you're looking at between one and two years uh, after surgery. You'll note also on the slide that it was significantly shorter, the time to infection in the UCLA series as compared to the Montreal series. So mean time to infectious keratitis, as you note, just under uh, two years. Bacterial keratitis appearing earlier after surgery as compared to fungal keratitis. In regards to bacterial keratitis, really no significant difference between the time to diagnosis at UCLA versus Montreal. Looking here at the annual incidence of infectious keratitis, in the blue line, we have the number of cases per year out to six years after surgery. In the red line is the number of eyes reaching each time point, and that gives us in the green line, the incidence. And again, you'll note here that the incidence is the highest in the first two years uh, after surgery. So how does infectious keratitis present following 
keratoplasties implantation. Well, usually what you'll note is an infiltrate underneath the edge of the front plate. And this is sort of a classic appearance uh, of an infectious keratitis in a K-PRO patient. So weight presents in about three quarters of patients. In almost two thirds, the donor cornea peripheral to the front plate, as you see, I'm highlighting here with the arrow, is also involved. And so that allows you to collect a culture to identify what the organism is. But in a certain percentage of patients, in this series, about 14%, the infiltrate's confined to underneath the edge of the front plate, as you can see here in this image, which makes it impossible to collect a culture. So bacterial and fungal cultures were obtained in 47 of the 57 presumed cases of infectious keratitis. Uh, 22 of the 47 bacterial cultures were positive and six of the 47 fungal cultures were positive. And so that gives us a bacterial to fungal ratio of about three to one in Los Angeles and about seven to one in Montreal. And that may well be of course, because of the different climates in the two cities. So, if you develop a bacterial keratitis after K-PRO implantation, at least in North America, what are the most common organisms? Well, in almost all cases, 21 of the 22 bacterial isolates, it's staph or strep. So if you're going to be prophylaxing in your K-PRO population, at least again in North America, against bacterial keratitis, those are the organisms you wanna be concerned with. So something that has good gram-positive coverage is most important. We next looked at demographic and surgical risk factors for infectious keratitis. The first risk factor is being in my practice. Uh, we see a higher incidence of infectious keratitis at UCLA as uh, compared to uh, Montreal. We also now with a larger number of patients and longer follow-up do see a higher risk of infectious keratitis in patients with a history of cicatrizing disease as you note here, as compared to those without cicatrizing conjunctivitis. Again, this was something that we did not find to be a significant difference in our initial study. There were no significant differences in the, infection, in the incidence of infectious keratitis for other demographic factors that we looked at, uh, such as history of glaucoma, prior glaucoma surgery, uh, the optic type, et cetera. But we did notice, interestingly, a borderline significant association uh, with a titanium backplate as compared to the PMMA backplate. I honestly don't know what that association would be, uh, but this is something that we observed. So in multivariate analysis, the only significant risk factor for the development of infectious keratitis, we looked at already was univariate analyses and multivariate analysis, the only one that remained significant was cicatrizing disease. Here we're looking on the y-axis, the cumulative proportion of infectious keratitis in the red line, those with cicatrizing conjunctivitis, the blue line, those without. And we, again, we see that higher rate in those with cicatrizing conjunctivitis. As I mentioned, we saw a association with univariate analysis of infectious keratitis with titanium backplate, but then did not remain significant in the multivariate analysis. So we next examine post-operative risk factors for infectious keratitis. The development of a persistent epithelial defect was associated uh, with increased risk of presumed infectious keratitis, as we can see on the slide. If we look at all cases of keratitis, as well as those were culture positive for bacteria uh, or fungi. As we uh, see here uh, also, the use of topical steroid did not uh, increase the risk of infectious keratitis, interestingly. In fact, when we looked at the duration of topical steroid use, we noted that prolonged use of topical steroid was associated with significantly decreased risk of infectious keratitis overall, as you note here, as well as decreased risk of both bacterial keratitis and fungal keratitis when analyzed separately. Topical vancomycin use, uh, as I mentioned, uh, used in my practice until about eight years ago, was not associated with a significant decrease in the incidence of bacterial keratitis, interestingly. However, it was associated with a significantly increased risk. We looked at its uh, hazard ratio of fungal keratitis. And this is something I think that the group in Boston has also reported. Um, however, we need to interpret this with caution because if you note here, there's only two cases of fungal keratitis that occurred while patients were on topical vancomycin. 
And these occurred, like I mentioned, in the first year or so after surgery, which is when I used the vancomycin, which is also when we know the rate of infectious keratitis is the highest. Uh, we looked at contact lens wear also and determined whether that was associated uh, with an alteration in the risk of infectious keratitis. And we found that the uh, was not associated with an increased risk or decreased risk of infectious keratitis overall or bacterial and, and fungal keratitis when evaluated separately. However, when the duration of contact lens wear was evaluated using a hazard ratio, prolonged use was associated with significantly decreased risk of infectious keratitis uh, overall. Now, of the how, how do we manage these patients and, and how do they do? Well, of the 53 cases with available outcome data, 34 of them were successfully managed with medical treatment. So overall, about two thirds of cases of infectious keratitis after capron implantation can be managed medically. For the 29 uh, cases, which the date of the resolution of infectious keratitis is known, the mean time to resolution was about three months. Of the 30 cases of medically managed infectious keratitis where the visual outcomes are known, nine eyes, around 30%, lost two or more lines of corrected distance visual acuity. So 36% of eyes required surgical intervention. Replacement of the K-PRO uh, with a PK was required in about 21% of eyes, as we see here. Uh, replacement with another keratoprosthesis performed in about 11% of eyes, and unfortunately about 4% required evisceration. The decision as to whether to remove the K-PRO and put in another K-PRO or put in a PK depend on a number of different factors, including the visual potential, whether we thought the eye still had an intraocular infection that was active, uh, et cetera. So infectious keratitis was associated with significantly increased risk of capro explantation, as you can see here on this Kaplan-Meier survival curve. The eyes that developed infectious keratitis were looking at the retention in these eyes in the red line, the blue line, those that did not develop infectious keratitis. Uh, there was no significant difference in the percentage of culture positive bacterial and fungal keratitis cases that required surgical management. So what about the complications that developed after development of infectious keratitis? Well, infectious keratitis was associated with significantly increased incidence of several complications compared to eyes that didn't develop infectious keratitis, including, as you see on the slide here, endophthalmitis, idiopathic vitritis, corneal stromal necrosis, retroprosthetic membrane formation, retinal detachment, hypotony, and cystoid macular edema. So to put our findings in perspective, uh, we report an incidence rate of infectious keratitis after capo implantation of about 0.35 per year, which is in the reported range of between 0.034 and 0.073 that have been reported in prior studies. But just saying, even though in this series, we reported a higher percentage of eyes that developed infectious keratitis, 19%, as compared to our prior study, looking at the rate at UCLA, when we looked at it as far as an incidence rate, it actually went down. And this is because we have longer follow-up for many of these eyes. And knowing that the rate of infectious keratitis is highest in the first two years, with a longer follow-up, the overall incidence uh, decreased. So in conclusion, infectious keratitis remains one of the most common complications after capron implantation developing in about 17% of eyes corresponding to annual incidence of about 0.035 per eye year. Risk factors, well, we're looking at indications, cicatrizing conjunctivitis. We're looking at post-op complications, persistent ethyl defect formation. Organisms, bacterial keratitis is almost exclusively caused by staph and strep. Again, this is in uh, North America, and it is more common than fungal keratitis, which is most commonly associated with Canada species. As far as treatment, failure of medical therapy requires K-PRO removal on about a third of cases. In regards to outcomes, infectious keratitis is associated with increased incidence of other post-op complications as we saw on that prior slide. So the significantly increased risk of K-PRO retention failure and the multiple complications associated with infectious keratitis, I think really underscore the importance of prevention of infectious keratitis in our K-PRO population 
through the use of appropriate antimicrobial prophylaxis, aggressive management of predisposing factors like persistent corneal cell defect formation, as well as prompt diagnosis and treatment in cases in which you suspect an early infectious keratitis. I want to thank the collaborators at the Stein Institute, University of Montreal, and also want to thank you all very much for your attention. I think we have reached our end of our symposium. Uh, Dr. Sharma, I don't know if we have any time for questions or if we need to say goodbye to our audience. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Tony Eldave, Dr. Kedrin Colby, Dr. Benny Jang, Dr. Elmer Tu, and Dr. Maskwa for doing this. Um, we are truly honored and it's a great uh, collaboration. I'm sure it is going to continue in future also. Thank you for those insights. I'll send you the link of this uh, symposia, so that uh, the link of this entire symposia, so that if you want to host it on your website, you can do so also. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks so much. Excellent, Thanks so much. excellent presentation by all the speakers and wonderfully moderated by Dr. Anthony. So mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's have a huge round of applause for all the speakers and for our moderators. <laughs> Great. All right. So with this, we conclude this session and we'll be starting with the next session for the day around 12.30 p.m. IST. Thank you so much. Thank you, ladies Thank and you. gentlemen. Have a great day ahead. Thank you.